Hello and welcome. My name is Torbjörn Nordling and I'm an assistant professor in automatic control at the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the National Shengong University in Taiwan. I'm also the general chair of this workshop. I'm now currently in the inner garden of the Department of Civil Engineering in a building built in 1957 in order to house the Department of Architecture and this building have been designed by the faculty of the Department of Architecture. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our honorary chair, Chair Professor Wu, that will welcome us. It is a pleasure to welcome all of you on behalf of the National Chengkang University in Taiwan. I'm proud that our team, the NCKU Parkinson's Disease Quantifiers, are one of the finalists in the OpenCV AI competition. They are also arranging this workshop. Now let us all learn computer vision and AI using the OD camera together. Hello and welcome. I am Akram Ashiani, postdoc researcher at the Department of Mechanical Engineering of National Chengkong University and assistant chair of this workshop. It is my honor to introduce Mr. Jagmohan Meher, an engineer in robotics and a passionate teacher. Heading the research and development department of SkyFi Labs, he has worked on different technologies like computer vision, robotics, mechatronic, internet of things, and machine learning. He will present computer vision in robotics and teaching OpenCV to beginners, which is the continuation of the previous one of the last day. Hello, ni hao, hola, namaste. People from all over the world, I would like to welcome all of you to the second lecture on computer vision in robotics and teaching OpenCV to kids and beginners. Now, let me start by sharing my screen. I had already introduced myself. I am a robotics engineer and an educator at Skyfa Labs in India. Before we begin, let's take a look at what are we going to learn today. In the previous lecture, we had learned a few basic concepts in OpenCV. This time we will be learning a few advanced concepts. Along with it, based on whatever we are learning, we'll try to build a project, color-based object detection using OpenCV, which is kind of a small application of something uh, big, like for example, Tesla car, right? Now, third thing we're going to work on is learning pedagogical tricks to teach kids and beginners. In the previous lecture also, we had learned a few pedagogical tricks. This time we will learn a few newer pedagogical tricks, right? Let's begin. I would like to begin with the first pedagogical trick for today. First revise and then continue. Before we begin the second lecture, I would like to recall all the concepts and all the lessons we had learned in the first lecture. I hope that all of you had attended my first lecture and with that hope I am continuing right now. We in OpenCV we had learned with the basics of computer vision, what are the applications? We learned what is a, what is an image, what is a video, and we did a few tutorials on how to read an image, how to change the color spaces, how to split the image into three different channels, and how to capture a video. We did all these in Python, and we saw practically how to do them. In the same time, we also learned a lot of pedagogical tricks. We learned that before we begin, we must connect first and then share. If we have a built, if we build a bridge in between the teacher and the student, it, the knowledge transfer would be very, very easy, right? Always begin with a story or an example so that you can connect all the upcoming concepts to that story. Explain the concept to the re re relatable examples. It is very, very important because we, when we are learning something new, this information has to be linked with something old existing in our brain. If that happens, the learning curve becomes very easy and things are very easier to learn for beginners. Add a few personal stories. So it is important to add a few personal stories because 
sometimes people lose attention span students might not be able to focus on what you are saying for a longer period of time in that case what should you do should you ask them why are you distracted or should you strictly tell them pay attention to my lecture or there is a better thing that you can do you can always change the topic and talk about something that might be more interesting to them for a minute what will happen is you will get back their attention and if you talk about some personal stories or if you ask them something about them in a curious way then they would like to share a few things right this way you can grab their attention and it will be easy for them to learn we also learned a secret sauce for teaching and that was smiling right so <clears throat> these are all the things that we learned uh, in the previous lecture today we are going to learn a few new things let's begin and today we are going to learn about the project that we are going to build today so i would encourage all of you to make notes so because we are going to learn a lot of things it might uh, be a lot of information for you so i would request all of you to make few notes on what we are doing learning outcomes in this we are going to learn the pipeline of how to track a colored object okay so what to do first what to do next what to do after that what to do after that simple and in each stage there will be a few functions that we are going to use and we will learn about those functions too again like i said let's begin with a story we all know that the tesla autopilot car can see the world but let's take a look at how it sees the world here i have a short video from youtube you can notice in this video that the camera is uh, is able to see the vehicle it is marking the vehicle it's marking the roads also it is able to mark everything the traffic lights even it is able to mark the human beings now you see there is a traffic signal so the vehicle stop and it is able to detect each and every element on the road that's that makes it really smart what we are going to do today is we are going to implement a small part of this te this technology color based object detection based on the color we will try to detect an object so here i have a smiley ball so we are going to make a project which will detect the smiley ball so this particular simple robot that we are going to build today will be detecting the smiley ball it is yellow in color so we'll be detecting the color yellow let's begin the pipeline for object detection now there are four stages in color detection first is image acquisition we need to acquire the image for that i have a camera over here and then we need to prepare the image the image in the raw format might not be capable or might not have the properties for analysis so we need to prepare the image and then go for the next step the third step is color recognition this ball is yellow so i will need to use those functions which will recognize the yellow color and the fourth thing object identification i have to identify in this whole frame where is the ball right so i need to find the x and the y coordinates and i need to put a bounding i need to put a rectangle around it right let's take a look at how to do all these things <clears throat> so this is the detailed pipeline when we are doing image acquisition we are going to do two things we will capture the video and we will read frame from the video because a video is a collection of frames we had learned it in the last lecture and we also saw the code of how we can capture a video the second thing is image preparation we are going to use something called as gaussian smoothing technique to make the image ready for recognition third thing is color recognition we are going to do two things here we will convert the color space from bgr to hsv and then we will also use something new called as a thresholding technique to find out the color the fourth thing is object identification we are going to use the concept of contours to identify the colored object okay let's go step by step in every step i will be explaining you the theory as well as i'll be showing you a tutorial on how to do it meanwhile you can make notes and if you want you can practice with me 
and we can build the project together. The first thing, image acquisition. We have already done it, so I will not spend much time on it. Let's just revise it quickly. So I'll be using a function called cv2.videocapture index. So index is the camera. So I, if you put zero, it will uh, take the default camera. If you put one, then it will uh, take the secondary camera. Cam is the video capture object. And what it does, it creates a video object. And the second thing, red comma frame equals to cam.read. This function will capture images very, very fast, which will form a video. So RET, we are using two variables here, red and frame. RET is a Boolean output, which, is, which means it's a true or false. If it reads the image correctly, it will give true, else it will give false. Now, after clicking a picture, this function needs to store the image in a particular variable. That variable is called as frame. So frame will have the actual image inside, right? Now let's go to the practical part of it. We did this in the last picture. I will go through it quickly. So we are importing CV to as CV. We are importing NumPy and this is the cam equals to cv dot video capture zero. I am having a primary camera on my computer. So I'm using zero. I am using uh, an infinite loop so that it will keep on capturing the video. And every time it captures an image, it will store it in frame equals to cam dot read. Okay. And then I am displaying the image, which it is uh, capturing in by using cv.im show. Again, over here, what I'm doing here is I'm using cv.wait key to wait for a key to be pressed. And if 27, if key equal to equal to 27, that means the escape key on the, on my keyboard. If I press the escape key on my keyboard, it will break out of the loop. As this is an infinite loop, I need to give a condition to break out of the loop. As soon as it breaks out of the loop, I am using cam.release, which is a function which will stop the camera and then I will destroy all windows. So we have done till here. We had learned this in the last lecture itself. Let's continue from here. The next thing is image preparation. So we, have, we are going to learn something about smoothing. What is smoothing? Uh, you can imagine it like, suppose you do a pencil art and then you take a cloth and you smudge the pencil, uh, the graphite on the paper, what happens? It becomes smooth. Similarly, the image that we have or the video that we have, it might have a lot of frequency, a lot of noise, a lot of sharp edges. Sometimes these noise and sharp edges will not allow us to do object detection in a good way. So that's why we try to smooth the image. So before we actually look at this, there are different kinds of smoothing techniques. Let me show it to you. Okay, so I would like to show you this thing is very important. The documentation for OpenCV. This is another important pedagogical trick to use when you're teaching programming to anyone. In whenever we're learning programming, there are a lot of open source websites from where you can learn these things. And OpenCV, it has a complete documentation. A lot of people, a lot of scientists have worked on it already and they have provided it. So you just search OpenCV and OpenCV.org is the documentation. Now in this, I have smoothing images also, right? So there are different techniques of smoothing images. Basically there are four techniques, averaging, Gaussian blurring, median blurring, and bilateral filtering. We are going to use the Gaussian blurring technique. Okay. So this technique is used to blur everything, but we will learn how to do it. Okay. First, let's take a look at how are we doing it. Now this technique, Gaussian blur has got three parameters inside. It's a function. It has got three parameters. The first parameter is IMG, the image that we want to blur. The second thing is K size kernel size. So for example, we have a pixel that we want to change. It will consider uh, seven cross seven or five cross five rows and columns. 
or matrix around that and it will try to find an average of all of them and store it in the main pixel. Now, third thing is sigma, that is standard deviation. If you want, you can add some standard deviation to it also. Now, let's take a look over here. Now, here you can notice clearly that if this is the original image, you can see that in the after blurring, it will become slightly, you can see the edges are also slightly smoothened, right? And there are different techniques in averaging. This is the averaging technique. Again, it is smoothened, but it is too blurred. In median blurring, it has reduced the noise. Median blurring is majorly used to reduce the noise and bilateral filtering. Bilateral filtering is almost similar to Gaussian blurring, but it will not allow the edges to smoothen. It will keep the edges sharp and it will smooth the other things. You can notice here the edges are still sharp, right? But for this case, we are going to use Gaussian blurring and we will take a look at how to do it. Let's go here. Hmm. So I will take another variable frame underscore blur equals to CV dot Gaussian blur. Kindly note over here, I am using capital G and capital B. There are three parameters. As soon as I open the bracket, you can see Python is giving me a hint of what are the parameters inside it. So first is source, second is kernel size, and third is sigma. Source is frame. My source is frame. And then my kernel size, I would like to give my kernel size as 7, 7. So I am considering a 7 cross 7 matrix around it. And for now, the standard deviation, I will keep it as zero. Okay. Now, having done this thing, let me also do one more thing over here. I would like to display the frame of blur and I will try to compare the original frame and the blurred frame. Okay. CV dot I am show. I will, I will name it as frame underscore blur. And the what variable I'll give you? I have to give frame underscore blur, right? Now, having done this, I will save it and I will run it. I will let's run it and we will save it. And let's see what happens. So here I have two images, two videos basically. And here you can notice, this is the actual frame. The everything is very, very sharp. But on the left hand side, Everything is blurred, right? So this is the difference. So this is the first thing that we have learned Gaussian blurring. Okay. Let's go back. Now, this is the second step we did. Third step, color recognition. Now to do the color recognition, first thing we need to do is we need to convert the color space from BGR to HSV. Why do we need to convert BGR to HSV? Now in HSV, the good thing is that it is not susceptible to environmental changes in the lightning. So for example, in real life situation, the lightning conditions might change, but if the lightning condition changes, the HSV value of an object doesn't vary a lot. In case of BGR, it might vary a lot, but in case of HSV, it is very, very robust. And that's why we are going to use it. Okay. So we had learned this in the previous lecture, we are going to use CV dot CVT color. And there are two parameters, IMG, the image and the conversion code. So let's do it quickly. And so let's do it frame underscore HSB equals to CV dot CVT color. I will take the frame underscore blur over here, right? Frame underscore blur. And I will use the technique cv dot color bgr to hsv cv dot color bgr to hsv. Okay. I will also display. I will also use I am show on this one so that I can see what is exactly happening. Cv dot I am show. Let's name it as frame underscore hsv. And what variable I'm going to use here, I will use frame underscore HSV. 
simple let's save it and let's run this module and let's see what happens wow you can see there are three different uh, videos the normal frame and then we have the blurred image and this is the hsp the hsp looks very colorful okay so having done this we will go to the next step the we have converted the color space from bgr to hsb the next step is thresholding techniques so thresholding what is the meaning of thresholding threshold is a limit beyond that limit we want to do something and before that limit we want to do something else so for example as we are going to detect a yellow colored ball so we will set the lower bound and the upper bound for this yellow colored ball how to find out what is the lower bound and upper bound of the yellow colored ball in the hsb space for that we will go to google okay and here we will search for hsb for yellow color here you can see shades of yellow in wikipedia here you can see the different shapes that a yellow color can have on the left side you can see let me increase the size of this screen so that you can see it clearly hmm. hsb 60 100 100 process yellow is 656 100 100 yellow is 60 40 100 then yellow 50 100 100 there are a lot of things right so we are going to set a lower limit and upper limit so that it can within that range it will be able to detect the color okay so let's go back let me turn on my video for now okay we will go to the code let us implement the lower bound and the upper bound over here for that i will take two variables lower underscore limit and i will use the numpy library over here np dot array i will make an array what is an array array is a collection of elements having the same data type so here i will give it 20 comma 100 comma 100 this will be my lower limit okay and the upper limit equals to np dot array i will make it as 60 comma 255 comma 255 so i have defined the lower limit and the upper limit these are the hsp values of the yellow color i am setting a lower and the upper limit now to implement that how to implement it we need to go back and learn about it first so here you can see we are going to use a thresholding technique what is thresholding let's try to understand that we are going to use a function called as in range and it has three parameters img that is the image the lower bound and the upper bound what is the use of thresholding it converts pixels based on their values okay let me give you an example so if i have a colored object over here then it will turn into white color the rest everything will be black so for example whatever in my frame whatever object is within the color range it will be white the rest everything will be black okay let's try to implement it and we'll see how it works sorry so frame underscore threshold equals to cv dot in range r is capital and here you can see we will give three variables over three parameters over here frame underscore hsb and lower limit comma upper limit okay and i am going to display the same so that we can find out how it looks like cv dot i am show this will i will write it as frame underscore threshold and the variable will be frame underscore threshold okay so we are done let's save the code and let's run it
Okay. Uh, I need to turn off my camera over here. So I will again run it and let's see how it, how it works. So here you have the threshold. It's completely black, but suppose I bring a ball. So you see, when I bring the ball over here, it works. Okay. So we have identified the ball using the thresholding technique. Now, the final thing that we need to do is make contours around it and we will put a rectangle so that in this, in this particular frame, in this one, we will be displaying the final output. Okay. Having done this, let's go back and let's take a look at the next step. So we are done with color recognition. The next step is object identification. So in this, we are going to use contours. What is a contour? If you, you must have learned contours in geography, it is a line joining all the places having the same height. Okay. Not exactly a line. It's an imaginary line. Here also it is a line or it's an object that will join all the pixels having the same value. Right now contours, it has three, uh, three parameters inside it. Okay. The image, the method, the mode. It's called the contour retrieval mode and the method contour approximation method. The contours, they return two values. We will name it as contours and hierarchy. Contours will store the array of detected contours in the whole frame. There might be many contours. It might detect different, different kinds of contours. So we will store all of them in contours and hierarchy stores the relationship between those contours. Okay. And let's take a look at how it might work. So this is something, this is an example of how contours work. So they try to form a line that is joining all the pixels having the same value. Okay. Now let's try to implement it. To implement it, we need to go back to the code and here we will start by giving contours two variables hierarchy contours my hierarchy is equals to we are going to use the function called as find contours cv dot find contours here i'm going to use the thresholded image frame underscore threshold and then two more things mode and method so before I enter into it, let's take a look at what are the different modes and methods we have. Let's go to Google. In this, you can notice in the documentation it is given. So we have <coughs> two methods. <coughs> Chain approx none. And this is the method for uh, approximation. And we have a method <coughs> called as RETR underscore tree. That is for the mode. I will go back. Let me write it down for you. CV dot R E T R underscore tree comma CV dot chain approx none. Okay. So these are the two mode and the approximation method. The variable contours is an array. Now what we can do is we can display the array using the print command. So I will write something like this. If the length of the array is greater than zero, that means if the array has some value inside it, if the length of the array contours is not equals to zero. Okay. Then what I will do, then I will print contours. Just to see what am I getting? Okay. I will save the code and I will run it and let's see what values we are getting when Okay. So when I have 
the ball in this and when i remove the ball there is no contours when i get the ball in i get the contours right so this is how the contours is working whenever there is a whenever it detects the ball it will show me the it will it will print the contours that is the array now we need to find let's go back and let's try to understand what are we going to do next so after that we need to find out after we found the contours we need to find out the maximum area and the features of contour with maximum area features means the x coordinate and the y coordinate so that we can put a rectangle around it right so to do that let's go back to the code and let's start with it i will comment this thing over here right now now to find the areas to find the areas of the contour i will use a for loop and in that i will write something like this cv dot contour area i will take a temporary variable c for my for loop for c in the contours okay what will this do this will give me the complete area of the contours i will print it let me print the areas and let's see what 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 are the areas i am getting okay i will save it and run okay here we have it so you can see i am getting there are so many contours and it's changing rapidly right and if i remove it it stops so you can see the the area which we are getting it's changing continuously because of the frame the frame rate is so fast it's changing right so but we have to find out the maximum area okay so let's go back now to find out the maximum area let me comment this also for now now to find out the maximum area and this is a this is an array right so i will write like max underscore index i will find out the index of the max contour I, and for this i have something called as np dot arg max this is the function which will tell me which index has the maximum value inside it okay and i will put areas okay now <clears throat> having the index number i need to use that index number and find out what is the value inside it right so i will write contours and inside it max index okay so what will this do cnt will store the value of the actual contour which has the maximum value of area inside it okay so now what we need to do now we have the now we have identified that this is the ball and it is stored in cnt but we need to find out the x coordinate and the y coordinate because we want to put a rectangle around it so for that we will use the bounding rect function x comma y comma w comma h so these are the four parameter variables that we are going to use bounding rect and bounding rect around c and t okay so what is the use of bounding rect actually it should be cv dot bounding rect okay cv dot bounding rect so what will it do it will tell me the x and the y coordinates of the rectangle the center of the rectangle and it's not a center it will tell me the one end of the rectangle and w and h are the width and the height of the rectangle possible width and height and finally i will put a rectangle around it cv dot rectangle now this function cv dot rectangle has many parameters inside it let's take a look first of all the frame or the image in which we want to put the rectangle and then we have to give two things one end one diagonal end of the rectangle and the second diagonal end so first diagonal end is x comma y and the second diagonal end is x plus w comma y plus h let me put brackets around it also okay so here we have this thing 
x plus w and y plus h. Okay. And then what color I want for the rectangle 25, comma 0, comma 0, BGR. So I will want it to be blue color. And the last parameter is the thickness. I want the thickness to be 2. Okay. So we have mentioned the cv dot rectangle function completely. Let's save the code and let's run it. Let's see what happens. Okay, so here I have the ball. And you can see in this frame, this is the original one. I am having the ball and it is detecting the ball. Okay, so finally we are finished. We have finished with the complete project on object detection using OpenCV. So now let's recap everything. So I am towards the end of the lecture. To finish everything, I will recap and uh, what have we learned today? We learned how to acquire an image or a video. Then we learned Gaussian blurring, a smoothing technique. And then we learned color recognition, how to convert a color from BGR to HSV. And again, we learned a new technique called as thresholding technique. Then we also learned about contours. What is the use of contours and how contours are used in object detection. And we learned how to make rectangles around the ob detected object. Okay. Now, this is, this is all about the technical part, but what about the pedagogical tricks that we have learned? So we have learned first revise and then continue. It is very, very important to connect the new information with the old existing information in the brain. That's why we need to revise everything continuously. Start with a story or an example. Today I began with the Tesla story. Weave a story or journey. So you saw that I had made a complete pipeline and we were going step by step. So when you try to make things in, in order, in like a journey, right? It becomes very easy for some, anyone to understand. Focus on troubleshooting. This is very, very important. Troubleshooting means whenever there is an error, you have to try to find a way to solve the error. So to help you with troubleshooting, there's an open source called as Stack Overflow. If you search any error, you will get a lot of people who, uh, this, is, this is a forum where a lot of people post their queries and experts answer them. Right. So it's an open forum. And if you have any query, you can, uh, you can look at it. And then very important, learn by building projects. At Skyfi Labs, we believe that learning happens when we do practical things. And when we are doing something like robotics or open CV, practical applications are absolutely important. Right. So learn by building projects. Today we learned one project. I would encourage you to learn more and build more projects and come up with more ideas, right? Encourage students to take notes. Today, I encourage you to take notes so that when we write down what we're learning, it becomes easier for our brain to capture it and store it for in the permanent memory, right? These are a few techniques that I have learned from a book called Study Smarter, Not Harder by Kevin Paul. You can refer to that book, but today, Again, I would like to give you another secret sauce. Then another secret sauce is learn to teach. The interesting fact about teaching is that it's a learning process. And when you are teaching something to someone, you have to explain things in the simplest format. Well, that is difficult, right? So you have to learn things, whatever you're, lear whatever you're learning, you have to learn it in a really good way. And you have to teach it, deliver it in a better way so that even a beginner can understand, right? I hope that whatever I have taught you, you have understood it, you have learned something new and you will implement all of this at your place. Now, to end it, I would like to give an optional challenge to all the viewers, to all the audience. If it's a, first of all, it's an optional thing. You don't have to, uh, it's not a mandatory thing. You can do it if you choose to teach open CV to a beginner. Okay. It can be anyone. You can choose anyone who might be interested to learn or who might be a beginner in open CV. You can teach them. Once they learn it, 
ask them to record a video and share their experience. Maybe they can add their uh, output in the video or they can tell how was their learning experience, how did they learn, what did they learn, right? And make sure the video is not more than 60 seconds. Once you get the video from that student, send it to the Nodling lab and the among all the videos that we get, the best video will be played in the fifth workshop, right? Now it's up to you to accept this challenge or not, right? So that's all from my side. And it was a real pleasure teaching all of you uh, the interesting topic of OpenCV and OpenCV in robotics and how to teach kids or beginners OpenCV, right? So thank you very much for listening to me patiently and I really appreciate it. Thank you a lot. Hello, Mr. Mayor. Hello, everyone. Welcome to join our second Q&A session of today. Firstly, thank you very much for the great talk and thank you for willing to join us online. So here we, ha I have, uh, we have gathered all the questions from your first presentation and the second. Let me speak them out one by one for you. So we have three questions in the first um, presentation. Okay. The first one is um, how to import the library. So to import the library, we use the keyword import and then we write the library name. For this, if you have a knowledge of the existing libraries in OpenCV, which you can get from the documentation, you will be able to import a lot of libraries, whichever you need. Thank you. Second question is, what is the 10 in CV weight key 10? Okay. Um, the 10, the parameter is the delay. For example, wait key will wait for us to press a key on the keyboard. But how much time should it wait? 10 seconds, one minute, or whatever time we want to give it, you have to give it in the form of seconds. So 10 means 10 uh, milliseconds, actually. In this case, it is milliseconds. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. The third question of the first presentation is, it seems that HSV is a big set of RGB. If that's true, why do we need RGB? RGB and HSV are two completely different things. Uh, both are used in different, different cases, right? For example, uh, if I want to split uh, an image into three different parts, I will use RGB, right? So I, am, I can make it red, green, and blue. But when I'm using it for open, uh, for the object tracking, uh, HSV is preferred because it is more robust to environmental changes, right? So it has its own pros and cons. See, thank you. Now the questions are from the presentation today. The first one is interesting way to detect an object. Why is Gaussian smoothing necessary as pre-processing step? Will the result improve more when compared to not using Gaussian smoothing? It's a very good question. Whenever we want to do image processing, the first step is to prepare it. And every image will have some noise in it or some sharp edges, which might create problems at the later stage. Gaussian smoothing is an interesting and a perfect technique to smooth the image and remove those high frequency noise as well as the edges. That's why we use it. Thank you for your great answer. The second one is, is it possible to make the color on the ball surface the same for the whole ball? This way they are visible when we apply threshold. It improve the contour accuracy? Well, this is another interesting question. We can do it, but um, if the light is from the right side, okay, then one part of the ball will be more illuminated and the other part will be less illuminated and we cannot do anything about it. But we can try to maintain an equal kind of lightning in the space we are doing the experiment, which might be beneficial. But in, in terms of coding, uh, even if the lightning is not very good, uh, as we are using HSV, uh, it will be fine. I think uh, it will still give us the output. Thank you. Next question. I'm curious, what kind of projects have you done before using this kind of technique? Well, um, I did two projects. Um, I'll just give you a brief outline of what they were. 
uh, i made a project in which we will uh, have a camera and at the park at the entrance of any mall when the cars come in we will automatically detect the number plate and we will extract the number and the alphabets from the number plate and store it in the database and we can uh, make the database uh, in such a way that if the car is permitted to enter only then uh, the security guards will allow it this is the first project the second project which i had made was uh, it was an interesting way for people who can't speak to express themselves okay for example uh, i can't speak but i want to do a video call with you so i will do hand gestures and you have to understand what i under uh, what i am telling by my hand gestures so we did the first very initial thing so if i do like this it will uh, the computer or the computer will understand that this is one this is two this is three this is four this is five so this is what this is the project that i had done to help uh, people who cannot speak thank you very much this question is Thank you for sharing such clear and easy to understand introduction to image processing. Is smooth a necessary pre-processing step? Yes, uh, it is uh, necessary because uh, every image will have some sharp edges and noise. If we do not remove the noise, still we might get the output. But the output might not be very uh, relevant or It it might not be very sure that we will get the output or not, right? So that's why uh, pre-processing is important. Uh, this is one way we are doing pre-processing. There are multiple thousand other ways in which we can do pre-processing based on what we need to do. The next question is followed by the previous one. Um, mm -hmm. How do we estimate the improvement compared to the result without smoothing? we can try that uh, it's very simple uh, we can make um, in the same code we can have two different uh, videos one which will uh, be running the video with smoothing and one which will be running the video without smoothing and we can compare the difference uh, right in front of our eyes right so uh, if you have watched my lecture carefully you will be able to try this by yourself because i have shared a ways of how to display multiple videos at the same time all you have to do is in the parameters you have to change the image or the frame that you are using right so it will be something interesting uh, if you are looking for uh, how to uh, what is the difference and you if you want to compare it thank you very much okay. the next one is so far the last question mm -hmm. um, the question is i guess the color will be affected by the light how do you adjust the threshold if the environment changed that's a very good question there is a technique called as adaptive thresholding technique okay in this what happens um the uh, so what technique we used in our uh, project was simple thresholding technique either it will become black or white right uh, the ball was completely white rest everything was black whereas adaptive thresholding is a much better uh, way because you know uh, image has different lighting conditions in different areas so in that case what happens if you use adaptive thresholding the algorithm will determine if uh, the pixel based on the small area around it okay and we will get different thresholding values for different regions of the image based on the illumination and that way we can actually uh, use uh, even if the lightning condition changes we can use adaptive thresholding thank you very much for your great answer thank you and thank you very much i think this is the end of today's workshop um we will have our third hackathon at tomorrow 10 a.m for more information please check our website we'll put the link in the chat later look forward to see every uh every one of you thank you everyone thank you mr mayher Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Bye.